Good evening. The date is um, Monday, April 22nd, and the time is 5.30 p.m., and we are getting ready to start our work session, and we will start out with a presentation and city updates from Mr. Brian McCain. Thank you, ma'am. Um, city updates this week. This weekend, Sound the Alarm event with Pueblo Fire Department and the American Red Cross was very successful. 114 people were made safer, 93 alarms installed, and two requests for bed shaker alarms. Um, recently, Ch Chief Noller was selected and attended the first part of the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Seminar, known as LEADS. The LEADS program was developed in 1980 to assist the FBI training for municipal, state, and federal leaders who oversee staff of 50 to 500 employees. The training was held in Quantico, Virginia, and the program selects only 50 law enforcement executives annually to attend this training over two separate weeks. And then finally, there will be a webinar on May 1st from 5 to 5.45 p.m. on Intro to Board Service and How to Apply. It's a free webinar to learn about the types of boards and commissions, what board service means, expectations and time commitments of members, the application process and current vacancies. It's free, but you must register and you can just go to Pueblo.us, the webpage, and it'll be up there. And that's all I have. All right. Well, thank you. Any thank questions you. from council? Anything um, from the mayor directly this evening? All right, well, we'll move on to um, Mr. Gil Romero, our lobbyist and his um, group. Hi, Mr. Romero, how are Good you? Evening. Good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you uh, for letting us uh, present this evening. Uh, we have 15 days left in the session uh, and uh, there are over 350 bills still uh, active in the legislature. Uh, so obviously uh, with only 15 days left, they're going to have some long nights if they intend to get all of those bills uh, out of both houses amended and, and sent to the governor. Uh, just wanted to just quickly uh, let the council know and the mayor know, uh, I, I know that we're, we don't have a scheduled meeting for next Monday, uh, but with just 15 days left in the session, if any city council member or any member of the uh, mayor's staff, if you have any questions uh, next week, please uh, email us, or text us, let us know uh, if you've heard something or you've attended a meeting and you'd like some more information. Uh, you know, these Monday uh, evening meetings are really helpful for us uh, to get information back. So we won't have that one next Monday, but please reach out to us if you have any, any concerns. Uh, two things to bring you up to date on this evening before I turn it over to my uh, colleagues is that we finally uh, will, uh, uh, we believe, see uh, Senate Bill 166 uh, in Senate Finance tomorrow. I say I think because uh, there's a question of whether or not the, the bill is actually read over the desk and, and the, under the rules of the House and the Senate, uh, uh, the, the public uh, is entitled 24 hours notice of a bill being scheduled for hearing. Uh, so there may be a challenge to whether or not that bill can be heard in Senate finance. If that uh, objection is not upheld, then we will probably hear Senate Bill 166. And just to remind you, because we've, we've thrown in a lot of numbers, a lot of bills, this is the number one priority for uh, manufacturing in Pueblo and, and specifically Evraz. And this is the one that really uh, focuses on air quality enforcement. Uh, it, as I like to describe it, uh, it, it is all stick and no carrot. Uh, these are pretty significant enforcement uh, uh, penalties that they impose. Now, there's also a private right of action uh, uh, under Senate Bill 166. Uh, we've been told if it's heard uh, that they're gonna take testimony and then they're gonna lay it over. Uh, the sponsors just come back. Uh, she was gone for about a week, uh, but we still believe we have the votes to kill Senate Bill 166. But uh, if that bill is heard uh, tomorrow, we will send, certainly send you a comprehensive report. Uh, the bill was heard in uh, transportation energy. There were some amendments that were made to the bill, uh, but those amendments still do not uh, 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 change the position of manufacturing specifically ever as they still uh, uh, oppose the bill. So that's one that we'll be following. The other one that we want, I wanted to bring to your attention is uh, one that uh, uh, that was just introduced. Uh, it's House Bill 1460. You may have read something in the paper about it. We've already received 
a letter uh, from the mayor's office opposing if the council decides that they'd like to take some action just because uh, there are only 15 days left in the session, if you'd also want to take a position of oppose, please let us know. And I will start out by telling you, this, this is a pretty significant change in law. Uh, let me just briefly outline it for you. Uh, House Democrats have introdu introduced a bill they say will increase protections for law enforcement enforcement members who report the alleged misconduct of their peers. But opponents said, said the sponsors never consulted public safety organizations, are arguing it singles out the law enforcement profession uh, and requires law enforcement agencies to investigate any, any allegation of mis or misconduct or criminal conduct involving their officers. Law enforcement officers are also obligated to report any misconduct by their colleagues and failure to do so would constitute a class two misdemeanor punishable by six months in jail or fines of up to $750. The bill also affords an officer subject to discipline for whistleblowing a private right of action. Uh, the bill's being sponsored by Representative Herod. I can tell you that there has been no stakeholder uh, on this bill. Uh, it is uh, receiving a significant amount of opposition from law enforcement. Uh, we will uh, send that bill out to you if we haven't. So you can see the full text of that bill. Uh, uh, but as I said, the mayor's office has already taken a position of oppose. And uh, it, as I said, I, I, with 15 days left, uh, it, it's a significant change. Uh, the, this bill was was brought by law enforcement, a couple of police officers who were uh, dismissed uh, from the Edgewater Police Department. But you know, you know, it's our, you know, our belief in our opinion on, on behalf of the city that, you know, this is one of those bills that re really requires everyone at the table to dis discuss all the implications. So that's that's House Bill 1460. We'll get that to you. If you uh, decide that you would like to take a position of opposition, uh, uh, take a position of opposition to the bill, uh, you can send a letter and then we'll get that out. The bill is going to be heard pretty quickly. Uh, obviously with 15 days left, but uh, those are the two I wanted to, to talk to you about and I'll turn it over to uh, quickly to uh, other members of the team. Okay, thank you, Gil. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we just have a couple of quick updates. First off is House Bill 1028, Overdose Prevention Centers. After a lengthy hearing last Thursday night, this bill was killed in its Senate committee. And next is House Bill 241434. The title is Expandable Affordable Housing Tax Credit. This is being carried by one of the JVC members, uh, Representative Byrd. The bill aims to enhance the existing Colorado Affordable Housing Tax Credit program by increasing the annual all allocation of tax credits over the years 20 2024 to 2031. The bill would add 20 million in tax credits annually from 2024 to 2026, 16 million annually from 2027 to 29, and 10 million from 2030 to 31. To spur construction quickly, it would require that qualified taxpayers who typically sell the credits to investors in exchange for cash needed to build claim 70% of the amount of the new credit resources in the first year of the credit period and claim the remainder within the following five years. So that th this provision aims to provide immediate funding and reduce the financial burden on developers and investors. This bill's already been heard in its first committee and was passed unanimously. It's got broad support from both the business community and housing advocates. Um, th those were our two main, main updates, as Gil said, Please feel free to reach out to us. The The bills are moving fast. Um, and with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions from council? Um, with the support for the bill that he's talking about, was are we gonna get a, a letter written by Alyssa that we sign or did we just need to forward an email? Yeah, I sent one on Friday on my behalf, but she can draft one for the council if anybody wants to stop by and sign it tomorrow. Okay. That's sufficient. All right. Thank you. The I think the hearing is tomorrow at one o'clock. 
during no it's going to testify so okay um so if, probably need to get in early yeah to sign it yeah okay All yeah right. and, we'll, and we'll make copies here and pass them out to committee members okay anything else from council well gentlemen thank you for your time this okay. evening and, have a have um, a good break. Have a good break from us next week, and and we look forward to, look forward to seeing you the following week. All right. Well, thank you. You guys have a good break from us too. But I know you <laughs> have a lot going on up there at the Capitol, so it's it's just a few more weeks, though. Yep. Thank you, Madam All Chair. Right. Have a All good right. evening. Thank you. Okay. So next um, on our, the agenda is um, Mrs. Um, or Ms. Huerta from uh, Senator Hickenlooper's office. Oh, it's Mr. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, from Mr. Hickenlooper's office, and he's going to bring us up to date on the uh, correctional direct spending um, secured for Colorado. And um, hi, Antonio. I'm sorry about that. I don't know. I, I I don't have my glasses on and I thought I saw Antonia. So I'm just sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Thank you. Thank you all just so much for having me. Yep. My name is Antonio Huerta and I am Senator Hickenlooper's regional director for Southern Colorado. And I just want to first thank uh, Councillor Martinez for the invite today and uh, Mayor Graham, thank you for having us and the close partnership. And also just congratulations to Brian for your recent appointment. I know we worked together a lot during Action 22 and looking forward to continued partnership. Um, just a quick update on just kind of where we're at uh, right now. About two weeks ago, Senator Hickenlooper uh, actually visited Pueblo and we had three separate visits. The first was a woman-owned small business roundtable. The second, a Pueblo veterans listening session. And the third, a uh, visit to the Transportation Technology Center, where we worked to really highlight the Railway Safety Act. As you know, there's been derailments across the nation, and we can really test and study and research items right here in Pueblo. So we got to ride a hydrogen train. The mayor was able to join us. And uh, we really got to champion at least that legislation and try and move that forward. That being said, I'm here for congressionally directed spending. Congressionally directed spending is an update from the traditional earmark process. The earmarks were gone for about 12 years. And then when I first started about three years ago, so it was, um, when was that? 2021 about the congressionally directed spending process came out. And these moved away from traditional earmarks and became very, very public opportunities to actually get dollars into communities. So we've worked with Pueblo a lot, actually, the last few years to actually get dollars here. And one of them, the most recent one, is actually the Transportation Technology Workforce Development, uh, CDS um, funding, which was about $949,000. And this went to the education and training experience uh, at CSU Pueblo to actually help students get into the workforce, specifically in the multimodal transportation technology arena. Um, and then last year, actually, when I was last here, we actually got a quick, uh, really insight onto what CDS was able to purchase. And it was the public crime and accident scene scanner, which I think we set up right here in this room and it did a quick 360. And we got to actually see what the scanner can actually do and support, um, our first responders. And then one of the larger ones that we've actually been able to secure for Pueblo is the Mariposa Center for Safety, uh, about 1.5 million for them to actually enhance their programming. I think it was formerly the YWCA, but now Mariposa. So moving forward, um, I really just do wanna talk about resources for constituents. So as Brian is aware, as a former staffer, um, we have a constituent services program and we call them constituent advocates. And we have two based in Colorado Springs. And one of them is actually the director of constituent affairs. And I know recently there was a really big case that came out concerning the VA. And the first time we had heard about it was actually in the newspaper and items like this that really touch the federal agencies, your congressional representatives can actually navigate the federal agencies for you. There has to be a privacy release and various other just little things that you have to navigate, but I can share my information as well. 
we can connect you with a constituent advocate to help you actually navigate these federal agencies. So moving forward, if we're supporting folks that like the similar situation with this VA case, we can actually help. And Brian has my information too. So if anyone need, we jumped on the phone with them right away and we're actually trying to expedite as much as we can. And then the last thing I really want to kind of bring up that is very constituent focused first is our grants newsletter. So as we probably hear, there's billions of dollars coming out of the federal government. We have the infrastructure funds, IRA, Chips and Science, like where are all these billions of dollars going, right? So Senator Hickenlooper had been hearing that a lot. So he actually hired someone full-time from the state who is now based in DC to actually find those dollars for us. So whether that's upcoming grants, upcoming just opportunities for people to apply, we have that in a concise newsletter now that comes out every two weeks. So CDS was on the last one. And we can actually blast that out and support with letters of support from at least Senator Hickenlooper and sometimes a joint letter with Senator Bennett. And we're actually in close partnership with Luann Martinez, who is your grants um, professional here at in the city. And we're actually working with her in various infrastructure grants and as well as several CDS projects. Um, besides, besides that, that's all I have for you all in terms of congressionally direct spending, just kind of an update of where Senator Hickenlooper has been here in Pueblo and, um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions from council? Councilor Martinez. I really appreciate that update, Antonio. When I got the, um, you know, your newsletter, it was so exciting to see that Pueblo was on one of the, like one of the major awards for CDS. And I was like, we need to talk about this in council. Um, can you talk a little bit about what tangibly the fund, the CDS funds at CSUP for transportation technology are going to do? I cannot talk tangibly to what that would look like. But I know President Valdez, um, who's a new president at CSU Pueblo, was actually at TTC with us and gave kind of a broader overview of what that may look like. Um, but as to the specifics, uh, we would have to talk to CSU Pueblo on where those dollars would be navigated. But I know they were earmarked towards that program. Well, I think it's great, especially with the recent train derailment, even in our own community, to have more funds that support research to, you know, to continue being safe, I think is great. Um, Antonio, off the top of your head, do you know how much we've Pueblo has received in CDS funds? Off the top of my head, I do not know the exact dollar amount, but just in what I read, I would say we're closer to about the $3 million mark. Great. Well, we, I, on, I guess on behalf of council, we really appreciate the investment from um, Senator Hickenlooper's office in Pueblo and making more grant funds available for us. Absolutely. So thanks. Thank you. All right. Anyone else from council? Well, thank you for your time, Antonio. Thank um, you. Thank you, ma'am. And um, keep us updated. If you have some more information you want to share, just reach out and we'll get you on the schedule. Absolutely. And I know my counterpart, uh, Renee Martinez with Senator Bennett, and I are happy to give updates anytime you need them. So if you hear information from the federal government, just feel free to reach out to us. Um, Alyssa and Tracy, are, or, I feel like we have each other on speed dial and they'll they'll schedule us in. So okay. thank you so much. All righty. Well, thank you. Have a good one. Um, so next we have up um, Kurt Maddock with the CyberCube School. Is Mr. Maddox present? Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Ready? Yep, we're ready. Uh, so, welcome, Mayor Graham, Council. Turn your mic on. Oh, welcome, Mayor Graham, uh, uh, Councilors, and uh, so my name is Kurt Maddock, and this is Ralph Schroer. Uh, we're here with the CyberCube Cube today, and I know we presented back in November to uh, about half of the original City Council. 
So we're looking forward to having a good discussion with everybody tonight. But uh, so we're wanting to move, uh, if you can move to the next slide there. Oh, I have this clicker. Okay. All right. Sorry. All right. So uh, we're wanting to move Pueblo forward and diversifying our workforce into jobs of the future. Uh, so our vision is that we're going to be building a cybersecurity workforce through our cyber cube and training both our youth and adults that we will be able to obtain high paying virtual jobs throughout the country. But there are these folks are going to be able to live here and pay taxes here and stay here in the community. Uh, so we're going to be able to offer great opportunities for our citizens uh, to have a very bright future. And, uh, you know, nobody has really solved Pueblo's decades old problems yet of high poverty and few high, play, a few high paying uh, employment opportunities. But we believe we have the solution uh, and a new approach to this problem. And it's the CyberCube in collaboration with uh, many partnerships in Colorado Springs uh, to build a regional hub of high tech talent. Uh, so there's our vision, uh, become a leading educational hub in Southern Colorado, uh, embracing cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, robotics, and ethical hacking skills to bridge educational and technology gaps uh, in our underserved areas while leveraging a national reach for employment. And our goal really is to provide advanced training and certifications to develop a skilled cybersecurity workforce, uh, promoting economic growth and national security. And uh, our approach is to collaborate with local industries using uh, innovational uh, educational methods to equip our community for success in high demand tech careers, positioning the region as a center of technological excellence. All right, uh, go ahead. <clears throat> well, so we are really trying to um, we have skill skills gap in cybersecurity. I'm. Mm, 20 years in Pueblo now have a cybersecurity firm and uh, we're providing cybersecurity services for uh, local businesses and it's hard to find good people and on the other side we have CSU Pueblo who has the cyber wolves and they have some of the most intelligent young people who have to leave uh, the city and our community because we don't have jobs that's one of the problems I've seen and uh, I'm, I'm sure, hopefully you read all the slides, but I, I wanted to address this since we're here for the second time. Um, we're really trying to make a change. We're truly trying to make a difference. And uh, um, I hope that I get enough questions I can answer for you because there were some concerns. And I understand um, we're not trying to compete with CSU Pueblo. We're not trying to compete with PCC. We're trying to fill this gap. We have PCAP. We have 1,600 people leaving uh, the community over the next two years. And uh, we're working with Pablo Plex, and there's an interest of about 60% of these people to become educated in cybersecurity. And uh, neither PCC or CSU offer a three months, six months um, startup package. They have more like a two year, four year career package. And if you have a mortgage and kids, and, and uh, you can't just uh, take off for four years, that's what we're trying to close. Um, you know, I'm going to uh, jump through those. We have, you know, ec economic disparities. Workforce development, that's really what we're trying to do. We talked to Petco and, uh, you know, I um, I always ask, why can't we attract um, technology companies to Pueblo when, when Colorado Springs uh, again and again is uh, very successful. They just had another company come to Springs with about a thousand jobs, I, I understand. And uh, um, so I, I reached out uh, to these people, whether it's uh, um, uh, 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 the economic developing uh, group or cybersecurity firms in Colorado Springs. And, and we all agreed that Pueblo has a unique opportunity here. Um, we are in Southern Colorado. Uh, we're the gateway to Southern Colorado. We can reach more people in Southern Colorado than, than they can. So they're very interested um, working with us. And I think this is a time, this is an opportunity. The accelerator is actually the Pueblo uh, Pica people. You know, the, the challenge we had I, I worked with Dr. Roberto Mejia from CSU Pueblo, um, and, I, and I noticed five years ago is that the cyber wolves are leaving this community. Well, how do we fix that? Well, with 1,600 people leaving Pueblo, and now we have an opportunity to give them a la carte um, fast track right here, and we have a good chance to keep them in Pueblo. All right, so as Ralph mentioned, uh, we have the PCAP and PCD workforce that we really wanna keep here. These are high paying jobs today. And so if we can you know, keep five or 600 of these folks in Pueblo, uh, that would be a huge win. And those are all 
would be primary jobs that would be we would be reskilling in cybersecurity careers. Uh, the other part of this uh, CyberCube is that we want to continue to develop our middle and high school students, um, and we have an enrichment program starting in the fall. It's going to be the first one in the state of Colorado for cybersecurity education. So we've been approved for that. Uh, we're also, uh, you know, would like to expand to all 10 high schools. Um, we have these uh, events coming up, like we have a Spanish speaking cyber summer camp. Uh, we have these girls uh, in uh, International Day of IT events, uh, Capture the Flag events, uh, field trips and things like that, just to get, get people exposed that our students to potential careers in IT and STEM and cybersecurity. Uh, and then number three here is really the bring new high tech companies to Pueblo. That's the one thing we haven't been able to do yet. But if we know if we have this uh, developed workforce in cybersecurity and high tech, that we're going to be able to uh, be more attractive to these companies to come to Pueblo. Uh, and then the other option here or the other thing to really point out is that we have the option to be part of the RISE ecosystem. So Colorado Springs uh, and all of their partners, uh, they they, they were phase one awarded for this RISE uh, grant and uh, phase two is coming up next year. So um, we have, the, as a CyberCube, have the opportunity to become part of that uh, RISE ecosystem, which would be up to $160 million in grant funding. But, you know, we, we've been making these partnerships with the Colorado Springs folks, but we have to continue to develop. And that's what they would like to see is, you know, having this built out and show some um, some other partnerships in Pueblo. So, uh, so this this next slide really just shows uh, the the nine organizations involved currently and the the Rise Grant. And uh, so, like I said, we've been we've been working real closely with them and the National Cybersecurity Center uh, and some other partners up there, the Space ISAC. Uh, so, you know, they're excited about what we're trying to do with the CyberCube, and uh, they they would like us to be a partner. So, all right. And then uh, here just kind of talks a little bit about the high school uh, youth and, and STEM pipeline that we're trying to build. So we've had uh, have a, a successful program at Centennial High School called the Cyber Dogs. Um, we also are in Walsenburg and Canyon City. Uh, we have some, we've been teaching uh, instruction there. But what we're trying to do is also grow that into all, all the high schools and expand out into the rest of Southern Colorado where it's it's kind of a digital divide down there. So uh, so moving on here. So our uh, we have two options, I guess, for your consideration tonight. And option one is a $300,000 investment uh, from the city of Pueblo. And that would strictly go towards uh, cyber cyber workforce training and certifications. We could train up to like 75 citizens from the chemical depot and the community with that funding, as well as to continue to build out our youth programming. Uh, these would be primary jobs, obviously. And then option two uh, would be a, a $1.7 million 0% interest loan from the half cent sales tax fund. And that would actually be repaid and forgiven through uh, the primary job creation that we're, we plan on doing. So uh, those are kind of the two options. And then um, I guess just one other thing uh, I wanted to mention is, I think back to the 1960s, uh, you know, when David Packard, uh, who is from Pueblo, he wanted to build a computer factory in Pueblo. Uh, but the leadership team at that time uh, said they had the steel mill and they they weren't really interested in, in having a factory. And so he ended up going to Colorado Springs, creating an engine, engineering school at UCCS, and kind of the rest is history, you know. So I kind of see that as like a defining moment for us, you know, um, how we can, we have a really op a big opportunity here to do something different for Pueblo. And, uh, you know, and, and hopefully we don't repeat those same mistakes of the past. So I just wanted to add, you know, I came here 30 years ago and I like to solve problems. One of the problems I see here in Pueblo is, and forgive me, when I go to Denver or other places, I ask people, so what do you think about Pueblo? I hear interesting things. I'm going to share with you what I heard at the Space ISAC Center, which is a really high-tech ISAC Center at the National Cybersecurity Center. This was a 30-year-old lady. She did the tour with us. She was very nice. And so we kind of you know, um, choked around a little bit, got a, got a good tour. So I asked her, so may I ask you, 
uh, what do you think about Pueblo? And she immediately blushed and she looked at me and no, I, I don't I don't want to. I said, no, 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 it's all right. Just it's just us, you know. So tell me what you think about Pueblo. She said, dirty, blue collar, low income, and high crime. Have you heard that before? Have you heard that Pueblo is like there's a stigma? So how do we change that? How do we change the stigma? How do we bring, how do we keep 1,600 people in Pueblo? I tell you, with cyber, our market reach is not just 20 to 30 miles. I have an interest from the National Cybersecurity, from Scott Sage and from UCCS, Gretchen Bliss, to come to Pueblo and work with us and repeat what they have already successfully produced in Colorado Springs. Why not take this opportunity and make it happen right here? and attract high paying jobs companies to come to Pueblo. If people from Pueblo, I'm sorry, if people from Colorado Springs think that Pueblo is dirty, low income and has no future, what do you think companies who are coming to Colorado Springs think about us? They're gonna pick Denver and Springs. They're not even going to look at Pueblo. So the only way to fix that, if we make a big splash. And if we have a cybersecurity invest investment here and a cybersecurity force, we will be noticed. Thank you. Any questions from council? Councilor Flores. Yes, uh, thanks for that presentation. Um, the uh, I have had several discussions with you, Kurt, uh, regarding uh, your idea. And uh, I think what you uh, are saying is really confirmed with the information that we develop on a monthly basis in our economic dashboard. When I tell people that we have uh, over $3,800 $3, jobs that are available in Pueblo, and we have uh, 4,200 people that are unemployed, uh, it gives you a clear picture of what the problem in Pueblo is, is that we have a workforce development problem in training people in the right jobs. And I think you're on the right track uh, because I think that we could be the center uh, and kind of creating an economic uh, development model where what we're selling is a workforce. We're not selling uh, anything else uh, by what your idea is creating. And what that is, is right now, if we went out to try to find a cybersecurity company to locate to Pueblo, uh, the first thing they're going to discover is that we do not have trained people to work there. And uh, a, a lot of these companies are sensitive to their employees. They're looking for housing for them. Uh, they want them to be in a, in a community uh, that uh, is training people in those areas. And obviously, we have some graduates coming out of PCC and out of CSU Pueblo, but they're leaving town. And our dashboard confirms that, that they're leaving town because we have a list of all the high-paying jobs that we have in Pueblo Nowhere along that line is anybody, uh, we don't have anyone looking for cybersecurity. They've given up exactly. or it doesn't, it, it's, it just doesn't, uh, it's not an occupation that you find here because there is no place to work. And I mentioned earlier, uh, as far as the sales tax fund, uh, the first thing I would do if I were you uh, is set up a meeting with PEDCO. Uh, Petco is basically the vetting company that we utilize because it's really the city council that makes the decisions on this. But after Petco has looked at what you guys are wanting to do, uh, you know, what um, opportunities they, they, they are, and that it would make their job a lot easier in bringing technology companies into Pueblo mm -hmm. if you guys are creating the workforce, if you can wrap that up in a big bow and say, here, uh, you know, we've got a hundred trained people that can start tomorrow. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think we'd have any trouble attracting those kinds of businesses, but I think the first thing you do, uh, I, I'd like to keep your option one still on the table, but I think that we need to have a deeper discussion, a deeper dive with Petco uh, because they're in the process now of kind of changing uh, how they're looking at business. And I'll give you one example. Uh, we have come. We we could have a company come in that wants to build uh, some sort of a, a widget, whatever I'll call it, a widget. 
And uh, what they do, instead of building it themselves, they create a consortium of eight different companies and they all bring in the technology that's needed to create this product. Well, our model would only give money to the prime company that has no employees. They, they're the idea people. And so we've got to start looking and expanding how we provide incentives. And I think uh, that you present op another option of how we should be looking at creating economic development by creating a workforce. Uh, and we have the people here to do that. We just need to train them. And uh, so I, I would advise that you at this point consider meeting with PEDCO. Uh, I, I, I represent PEDCO on city council and uh, the mayor's on the, on the uh, council too. And so is our president uh, of city council. And so we got to have a, a discussion on that. And, uh, but I think, uh, I think you're onto something and I'd like for us to kind of move in that direction on the higher number. And then maybe you, you might talk a little bit more about the 300,000 investment uh, as to what that's going for, because your original idea was to create a school uh, and uh, you, if you could elaborate on that piece a little bit more. Yeah, so great. there are uh, like a half a million uh, unfilled cybersecurity jobs currently in the U.S. So, you know, there's just, it's a huge, uh, huge problem right now. And like, I just think of the millions of dollars that have left our community because of ransomware and of scams because we haven't had enough IT trained professionals working at our companies, you know, so it's it's a huge problem in our our, our community and um, we have met with Pedco once already. Um, we were open to meeting with them again. We just have been trying to you know try to uh, tell everybody about the CyberCube as much as possible. But yeah, we'll we'll reach out again. We've been applying for a lot of different grants. Um, so uh, the three hundred thousand really would be focused on training a, a bunch of people from the Chemical Depot and our community from like the Workforce Center. Catholic charities, whatever organizations we can pull from, you know, people from that would be, you know, good candidates that have the aptitude for cybersecurity careers. Uh, so, you know, we're open to that. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't. That was the original presentation you made. I didn't yeah. want to lose that in this minutia of, yeah. of other stuff that we're talking about. The $1.7 million would allow us to kind of build out this world-class cyber cube that would, you know, be really attractive to for sure, the Springs uh, folks in their ecosystem, as well as the rest of Southern Colorado, right, where they could come and bring bring their students, bring, you know, we could train people from all over the country, but for mainly Southern Colorado people to start. Uh, so that would allow us to kind of build that whole thing out a lot faster. So the 300,000 would just allow us to show some, show some uh, you know, ability to, to hire primary jobs or train people for primary jobs. Uh, and that's what the purpose of that would be so um, thank you okay uh councillor martinez yeah I, I appreciate that clarification kurt because i remember last time you guys came here it was like a legit cube school as part of the funds that you were requesting but now it sounds like it's more about capacity building uh, and skill building so if it's not an actual school where are you guys going to be at so Obviously, location's a, a big part of this, right? Because uh, the place uh, at Water Tower Place, uh, it's obviously a perfect location for uh, this because uh, we we already have, we, we're already attracting cybersecurity companies. We have two current cybersecurity companies there already. So we want this to be the kind of the, the main, we want to put a spotlight on Water Tower Place because it, uh, it's right there at, at the intersection of I-25 and, you know, close uh -huh. to Highway 50. We have 10 gigabit uh, fiber already there, which is really important for, you know, uh, for for security and, and high-speed training and everything like that. Uh, it's also a ideal SCIF space, which is a, a secure government uh, location building. There's no SCIF space in Pueblo today uh, because of, you know, it's a type one unlimited building for uh, you know, it's like the same thing as a Pentagon. So it, it's because of the way it was constructed, it's ideal for SCIF meeting space. And so 
uh, you know, DOD space companies, they're very interested in skiff space. And so that could be, you know, a couple of the other building, uh, other couple of the other floors on that building where we have classroom and labs for, uh, you know, experiential learning and post certification training, things like that. So, but, but we're open to, you know, uh, explore other locations, but that, that one right now is, is the best that we've seen for location. Sure. It might be worthwhile in the conversation that Councilor Flora suggested with PEDCO um, about any infrastructure or space that they have, particularly if you're going to be dipping into the half cent sales tax funds to support it. Um, have you thought about approaching the county at all as well? About, I'm sorry, what? Approaching the county. Uh, we have had a meeting with the county, but um, they, I think they, they said that it was a real tight budget. So, you know, we haven't uh, heard anything back from them. That was back in early February. Yep. And then I guess this, so this question is for Mr. Gifford, based off of your, um, you know, just, I guess this is the first time that you're hearing this presentation. Would this qualify for the half cent sales tax funds? You know, I'd, I'd have to speak with them a little bit more to be able to form an opinion on that. So. Okay. Perhaps that would be a good conversation as well to have for follow-up. Okay, thank you. Councilor Aylip. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Kurt, as always, your presentations are good. Uh, I have the utmost confidence in your ability to uh, to do this, but this seems to me to be a, a, a presentation from 20,000 feet and that we don't know how many jobs are you creating in the school, uh, again, where's it going to be? And then if you looked at worst case scenario, the worst case scenario is no company comes to Pueblo. We invest in the cube, no companies come to Pueblo. And so what, what we're really doing is creating employees to leave Pueblo, which we're trying to stop. <laughs> so, it's kind of a catch-22, you, you know, I get what you're saying. You're, you're wanting to develop the school of dreams where if you build it, then these companies are going to come and they're going to uh, love Pueblo because we have all of this trained workforce. You know, I think, I think if you went further into the fact of reaching out to companies who would be interested in coming to Pueblo had, if we had this school and, and things like that, makes it much more attractive than, than uh, the, the dreamer part of it. Because we've been through this a lot in, in specific instances where we were expecting to invest in something on, on the hope that something else happened. And then if that doesn't happen, then you know, you always have to figure for worst case scenario, if it doesn't, if it doesn't come to be. Uh, also, as I told you before, I think, uh, I think the city has the perfect building to put this in, uh, but you won't listen to me. So <laughs> I'm not going to bring it up again, uh, but you know what I'm talking about. And I think that uh, if you wanted, if, if you, if you wanted a city council buy-in, on on creating this and and helping you then then i think you should really consider the pope block building okay. and you should come back to city council with a presentation saying we're going into the pope block building this is what we're creating these are how many employees and and blah 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 you know uh, but <clears throat> i think i think it's a it's it would be a valuable asset to the community. I just think we need a lot more information before before we could ever make a, and I agree with Councillor Flores, if you're going, if it's a primary job creation, that's that's the uh, economic development part of it that needs to go through PEDCO. Right. And then they would make a recommendation to city council. So okay. Uh, I said a mouthful. So. No, that, that was good. And uh, we'll take that um, in consideration, but uh, like, the PCAP, the Public Chemical Depot folks, uh, uh, their their workforce uh, training, uh, uh, you know, folks have said that a lot of these people they would like to, you know, obviously would like to reach retain in their company, and so if they were developed with the cybersecurity certifications, they could potentially be, you know, uh, still work at their company. So that that would be one thing. Uh, we would also work closely with all the employers in the community because. 
you know, some of them could take one or two or three or whatever. Uh, so there's, there's obviously opportunities that we could uh, keep those people in the community as well as, and if we can't, uh, if we can't recruit a company to, to Pueblo uh, with our, with our workforce, then we would be able to try to work with uh, a local, all these subcontractor as a subcontractor to all these DOD and space companies in Colorado Springs and see if we can't get a, you know, a, uh, a contract for for doing cybersecurity services. So that that's an opportunity. That's what kind of Canyon City has been doing very successfully. Uh, you know, they they didn't really recruit a company to Canyon City, but they were able to get a subcontract to a bigger company and then, you know, provide those cybersecurity services. So that's an option. I think I, Ralph. I have done. a friend in cybersecurity and he works from home. Yeah, I think is that a possibility? Yeah, with that's what, students? you know, a lot of these jobs can be remote. So of, of the 500,000 open jobs, there's probably 25% that, that could be uh, virtual or remote. So, so those numbers would be substantial, yeah, substantial. when you talk so. about uh, what you just said about these mm -hmm. companies that are interested. If, if we saw that with numbers and how many employees they'd keep and right. so on and so forth. Anyway, thank so you. I think that would be a part of it is just keeping these these people with virtual remote type jobs. So. And I just, I appreciate your question. And yes, um, when I came to the United States, I brought my own money. I built my own business. I failed. I stood up again. I now I've succeeded. It's, uh, I, I don't like to ask for money. <laughs> I really don't. I don't like to sit here and I don't like to ask for $1.7 million. But do you know why I'm doing it? Because we have 1,600 people who need to get a job here real quick. And we can't do it. We can, we can bootstrap this whole cybersecurity thing on our own. But it's going to take us five years. But we can't do it in a year. We, we cannot do it without funding. And I've seen the Pope building. Do you have 100 parking spots close by? We can always talk about that. So the cost to build a parking garage or a parking facility, I mean. That's not how, my program. No, I, I get it. But I, I will, But please don't get me wrong. The Pope building has been vacant for how many years? <laughs> Since the Pope got elected. Seven years, 10 years? Mm -hmm. Right, oh, 15 or 20. It costs how much how much a year? Lots. 700,000? Mm -hmm. So if we would have if the if the city of Pueblo would have sold the Pope building for a dollar five years ago, we would have saved 3.5 million dollars. <laughs> Thank you. The the water tower place. <laughs> I've been I've been in the water tower place for three years. It is a Taiwan unlimited building. It has an incredible opportunity. The the security facility itself is very powerful. The location is very powerful, and the attraction to young people is also very powerful. We're having a a capture the flag event for girls in ICT information communication technology on Thursday. I invite everybody to come. And just uh, visit, look what we have. It's it's a really great event. It's a gamified um, capture the flag event. So they have to break into stuff. And this is the first time we're doing this. And we're hoping we can do more. We want to put a spotlight on it. And, and um, I'm going to address the elephant. Ryan, Ryan McWilliams is a great guy. He has invested a lot of, lot of money into this building. And he's willing to, to uh, jump on that ride with us. He sees and shares our vision and mission. I trust him as a friend. I know there has been some challenges, but th that's what round tables are for. We can all sit together at the table. We can figure out what the challenges are and how we overcome them. Um, any more questions from council? Um, Councilor Gomez? Is the I'm sorry. training e equivalent to an associate's, bachelor's? That's a great question. So yes, we would follow... Um, um, uh, network plus security plus CISA plus so come to your path so and that's another question I, I wanted to answer earlier we already have um, memorandums of understanding with companies out of Colorado Springs and Texas they see the incredible potential zero acquisition cost for 1600 or 600 people if we are re really realistic and they can train them at $12,000 $16,000 they're, they're very uh, interested in working with us. So we already have these, these groups who want to come to Pueblo. And UCCS, Gretchen Bliss has told me that, you know, the Hispanic population is, is strong here and we are the gateway to Southern Colorado. So the opportunities are great. And yes, we build it and they will come. I guarantee you that. Is there, One more question. Is the educational piece maybe something you might want to look at? Because as you know, 
we had the seeds program mm -hmm. sharing electronic equipment uh, district and statewide. Mm -hmm. And that program, when we had the educational piece and people were able to get credit, mm -hmm. not just working on computers and helping mm -hmm. get them done, but they were also had a time that they had to go to school. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking PCC, what is it, two years? And get your degree at CSU is four years. Mm -hmm. So that might be another way to take a look at capturing that audience. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're working with some of the community college to offer credits or like college credits for, you know, if we're being trained in our certification program. So, okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Latino. I want to compliment you on your presentation. I also want to make a point. Pueblo is the home of heroes. Okay. It's the home of heroes. Yep. It may be dirty, but we're working at it as a council and as a mayor and as a community to, to bring it back to where it was. And uh, it is the home of heroes. And so we want the best for this community. Uh, we want it to move forward. I like your presentation. Um, I think that uh, there's a great deal of possibility there because I know that there's a great program at Colorado State University Pueblo in cyber tech. And uh, it's it's something that's that's here, so uh, I think we 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 would be very wise to to look at that very seriously. So, thank you. So, not many people know this, but Pueblo is actually the second largest veteran population in the state of Colorado, behind El Paso County. So, veterans are on our minds. They're already kind of cleared individuals. They already have security clearances. So. We obviously have an opportunity here to train them into cybersecurity careers as well. So, thank you. Councilor Hernandez. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, it seems like there's two pathways here that are concurrent, okay? And one is the depot with potentially 2,000 employees from the next, what, three to 36 months, the next three years, and 60% uh, or so, I'm recalling that expressed interest, right? Right. So that's the, 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 you know, I would say from my perspective, you know, the initial opportunity that can pay dividends. Okay. Uh, the second concurrent opportunity is the 1600 that leave Pueblo. And I think to Councillor Aleph's point, that's more of a, I don't say like a, a gamble, if you will, but, you know, risk down that path of educating as far as recruitment, training, and uh, placement, right? Uh, and so that pathway needs at the end of it for uh, uh, someone getting trained in cyberspace to be able to say, okay, at the end of this path, at the end of this journey, this training, where am I going to land? And if I have no place to land, then I'm going to land someplace else. Mm -hmm. And then to, to Councillor Aleph's point, then they're going to go north. Yep. Okay. So anyway, so I'm just looking at the pathways here. And then I'm looking at your ask to 300,000 versus the 1.7 million. And if you look at the depot as a pathway, as a more, I'll just say, tangible physical pathway, that's mm -hmm. that's certain, right? That pathway is certain. 100%. Okay, yeah. right? And then what is that pathway need? Is that, you know, uh, relative to this 300,000 or the 1.7 million? And the bigger question is the sustainability, you know, for either of this ask, if you will, mm -hmm. that you know, once you build it out, and I think well, that was your term, you know, building it out, then what's the sustainability? How does the revenue stream to make CyberCube sustainable, if yeah. you will? Because everything costs, right? I mean, it's, it's an investment and we want it to pay off dividends. So there was a question in there somewhere, if you could help me out. Yes, so so um, my, my long-term two, three-year vision is that we're profitable within three years. I'm trying to convince that there should be an employee-owned cyber security range. So we educate and uh, qualify and certify these people, and then they can uh, work in our own range and provide services all over the country, like penetration testing, uh, services like that, which are common. But we can probably and most likely uh, offer them at a lower rate because we're still a lower income uh, community versus New York or Chicago or any other big city. Can I can I interject? Right there? So you become a, you became a, you become a service organization entity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but also a training organization mm -hmm. for the depot because, yes. as I think I heard earlier, they they need uh, individuals that are trained in cyberspace mm -hmm. in order to retain them mm -hmm. 
because the jobs that exist are going to basically phase out. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and we also have an arrangement with BOCES, which is a corporation. Um, uh, they help um, students to, to they, they would pay us about $4,000 to educate those students um, after school in cybersecurity, in the cybersecurity field. So we have already that arrangement. So I see multiple tangents coming to the CyberCube, starting with high school, re-education mm -hmm. uh, vets. You know, it, it is really, I, 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 I cannot tell you, I know this is going to work with the 1.7 million or without. But if we have the accelerator, it's going to work this year. Mm -hmm. If we have to bootstrap it, it's going to be two to three, two to three years. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Flores. Yeah, a couple of things. First, uh, Pueblo has the cleanest air quality along the Front Range. In case I just anybody I repeated. No, I'm, I was told, no. I, I'm sitting here. I'm from Germany. I'm in Pueblo. I love this community. I, I said it at the last meeting. I love this community. This community has been great to me. I see that we have problems. So does Springs. So does Denver. A lot of it is, uh, uh, you know, old new. You know, old. I mean, they're yeah. looking at things. 20, 30, 40 years ago. Sure. We have the and, best tasting you know, water. And, uh, yes. So, I, I did the demonstration at the National Cyber uh, de um, not demonstration. Yeah, I did that too. Right? <laughs> I did the presentation at the National Cyber Security Center, and I had a picture from 100 years ago and a picture from the Riverwalk, and I asked how many people have seen the Riverwalk, and there's maybe 20%. Yeah. So we have a huge opportunity. Yeah, and to I, make I wasn't really, I, would, I was really speaking to the comment that was made, not to you personally, because oh, okay. you, you live here. We love here. Pueblo. I we, love it. We love Pueblo. <laughs> yeah. so that's uh, why but anyway, uh, yeah. we, we have a good example uh, that just happened this weekend. I, uh, we, we had a ribbon cutting for a new company that came in, a furniture company called uh, Phone Care. Mm -hmm. And they're building uh, school furniture. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they indicated to me, because I met the president, and we're talking, and he's saying... He had met with the city back in the summer of last year, and he had a choice of moving to a number of cities. And the fact that we had a spec building ready for them to move in made the difference. So here we're talking about a ready-made workforce. Here we had a ready-made building, and they're, they're up and running uh, on February 28th. Uh, they made their first furniture, and that's from July to just February 28th. And they now employ 50 people and hope to employ another 50. So uh, I think the strategy that the city uses, I mean, we've got to be flexible as to any way that we, you know, we bring companies in and create jobs, high paying jobs, especially in the tech uh, area. Uh, I think the the remote worker situation, I mean, we, we could, that's another maybe third area that Pedco can, can look at in incentivizing young couples to come to Pueblo to uh, purchase a home, which you can't do in Denver or Springs. They're too expensive. In Pueblo, you can still get a medium price of a house at around $340, $350. In Denver, it's $650. In Springs, it's $480. Uh, I, I think that's another thing that we look at. And then uh, I, have a, I have a grandson that uh, got a degree in, in computer science. And these kids that are graduating with computer science degrees, they don't look for a job. They're actually being picked out by companies. Uh, they have a job on the day they graduate and uh, these companies are just, just getting everyone they can that's graduating with that. So I think the degree itself that you're gonna be offering is so valuable uh, that I don't worry that they won't come, they will come. But anyway, thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions, you know, coming from our last work session. And then now we're, we're here because part of our last work session was that you were going to the county mm -hmm. to see about splitting the 300,000 at that time, but they're not participating. They're not, they're not offering you anything. They really, I think, believed in the mission as well. But again, they they indicated that there wasn't any budget uh, for for this. So yeah, yeah, our budget was over too for <laughs> this twenty twenty four. Um, I don't know if this is something that you can apply for through the CSAC funding. That isn't that deadline next month or something, Mayor. 
Democracy SAC? I'm not sure what it is. I don't know if something like this would qualify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would have to check just check that out because um, the other thing too was the school that has a whole occupancy change. Have you guys applied for the occupancy change? Because that takes quite a while. In oh. order to create a school there at the, I, I just spoke to the building official today about this. Mm -hmm. You would have to take that portion and it would have to, the occupancy change would have to be to fit a school mm -hmm. and the requirements for a school. So you'd have to have a set of drawings. You'd have to have all your plans in place. Have you guys in the last year that since I've spoke to you last even pursued that avenue of getting that occupancy change for the school? Uh, we have not. that's a long process. Yeah, we have not. Uh, we, we've kind of been in the initial planning stages of, okay, mm -hmm. what would a, we know one, one floor would look, be a classroom environment. We know one floor would be a lab where mm -hmm. people could get the hands-on mm -hmm. uh, training, right. To, to be hireable. So um, but again, we, we need to, you know, we haven't had any funding really to, to really kind of build out some plans. And Do you to, have any funding of your own for this project? Um, so we have in kind from, yeah. from Ryan McWilliams. He will help us. He committed to that. Uh-huh. In kind. Up to $300,000. Up to $300,000. Okay. Right. And then, um, also, I mean, if you go to PEDCO, and ask for this money, you're going to have to have a lot more than a power presentation. You're going to have to have it like a performa mm -hmm. of how this is going to run yep. yeah, because your income is going to be coming from the students. Yep. Are you going to be a uh, institution where they could apply for public, you know, for uh, student loans and so forth? Because no one has money just to pull out of their pocket, you know, to take mm -hmm. some of these educational seminars um, are you going to be that type of institution that can allow your students to qualify for um, subsidized funding and so forth to take these programs? Yes, the answer is yes, because we're working with existing, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, we're not trying to do it ourselves. We would work with Rapid Ascend or Moray Security Services, and they will do that. They already have those set up, those, those partnerships with vet, you know, vet partners, vet tech, a skill bridge, bridge, bridge. Uh, you know, a GI bill, they already have those kind of partnership. They already have those relationships. So mm -hmm. we would just be, you know, kind of using their relationships basically to, you know. So that your students could qualify for yes, subsidized yes, yes, loans. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so is it just a certification that they would be getting? Obviously not yes. a degree. And would they already be a student of a graduated student of cyber technology through like the university or PCC and this is just the training like a hands-on training program or are you teaching from the ground up? That's a great question mm -hmm. so if I may answer that so we have um, we sat down with the HR um, people from Patel, Pectel and Amentum and discussed what we should certify their employees for so they get rehired. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our approach. Second, um, just talking about Rapid Ascend. Rapid Ascend is a, is a company out of Colorado Springs. They have a 98% uh, place rate. So they all their students up to 98% are being placed within the, within the workforce. Um, so I, I think, uh, I understand your concern. I really mm -hmm. do appreciate it. But trust me, we have um, the connections and the um, vision to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. Because Bechtel, you would be thinking that if they're having to let go of all of these employees and they would want that they would invest in that. Do they have they offered to invest in yes. some of the monies that you're needing here? Was it seven thousand well, dollars? It, it would, they they offer some tuition re reimbursement. Yes. And then, you know, because they're getting dislocated, there would be state funding as well. So that mm -hmm. would also pitch in for the for our classes. Uh, and so there's some other state funding as well. But we do want, you know, the, the the students to have some skin in the game as well. So they would still have a little bit of money they would have to put in, yeah. you know, but it would all, it would all go towards this tuition, basically. So. Yeah, the, the, all this conversation really needs to go into a written plan to show us mm -hmm. that you have 
um, that you have a plan and that this plan is going to work and your commitment letters from everyone that's willing to put something in because we've, we've uh, done some investments um, in a, an example in a, in a um, preschool center or daycare center for a local nonprofit and the money's gone and the daycare center isn't there. Mm -hmm. And right. so um, we would, I think that before council ever moved forward on anything, they would need to see a professional, more like the bank at this point. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. and so would Pedco, but Pedco, if they were to, you know, um, uh, recruit cybersecurity companies, a lot of the Pedco stuff that comes in front of us has an educational plan as part of bringing a, a, a company here that um, gets taken care of in, in the deal. The other thing too is those companies, a lot of times, I think almost all those buildings are our buildings. Um, they're owned by the city. So there's something to take back if things don't work out. And there's just a lot to it. So I think, you know, going to Pedco and right now, like I said, we're over on our budget. So I don't know how council would feel about pulling out of a, the savings account to cover that, especially, you know, with the new administration and we need new positions. And there's a lot of things right now that we need to look at. There's a lot of problems, but please mm -hmm. think about the 1600 people who are leaving the community. That's an imminent problem that needs to be resolved now. How do we fix it? By all means, if you have a better idea how to train those people, how to finance their training, how to get them employed, let me know. Yeah. Well, the, when they did take that educational, those edu uh, chose that study, they knew that at this point, they would probably have to go out of town to seek employment because we don't have the resources here. Right. But I don't know how quickly we can get moving on this to save 1,600 people right now. because. Where still we don't have the cybersecurity companies here to fill those 1600 slots. No, but we can at least take 20, 40, 60 people, get them into the program, get them started. And while we're doing this, we talk to, to Bechtel, Bechtel and Bechtel and to the HR people and say, okay, we have now CSSPs, we have now Security Plus people. How many do you need? Can they work remotely? Can they stay in the community? Mm -hmm. That is already being discussed. So we, we can offer that today. We just would have to make it work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We just don't want to make it work. We want to make it interesting and successful. Mm -hmm. That's why it's going to take probably more than a couple of work sessions and a mm -hmm. PowerPoint to for Petco yeah, we do to have give a it a serious look. Line, uh, outline of a business plan so we can definitely get that over to you so yeah i mean to pedco you know i mean right now that seems to be if they're gonna willing to look at it um they can make things happen so, yeah okay thank you okay thank um, you if anyone much. wants to bring anything from council bring anything forward for these gentlemen they can just go ahead and contact mr gifford okay thank you thank you thank you all right. Well, um, any anything more from council? Um, okay, so we are adjourning. It's 6.39 p.m. And we will resume at uh, 7 o'clock. Thank you. I'll take you. I'll take you back to the bathroom.